our national security transition event. My name is Phil Carter. I lead the research program at CNAS looking at military personnel and veterans issues as well as civil military relations. And the civil military aspects of the coming transition in about 30 days are staggering. When we think about the vertical dimensions between the president and his or her generals and admirals and the 2.4 million men and women who serve beneath them, the 1 million civilians and the 1 million contractors, it's an enormous ship with a very small rudder at the top. The horizontal dimensions, how the military relates to all those other agencies that conduct national security, from Treasury to state to the intelligence community, is also staggering. And of course, the societal implications of this are profound as well. As we think about the linkages between the military and these national security agencies and the broader society that we serve, um, these are things that will face the next president at 12.01 on the 20th of January, and they are not challenges that the next president can ignore, nor leave to chance. Good civil military relations do not happen by accident or luck or provenance. They happen because they happen deliberately, and they are the hard work of those persons who serve in the administration and the president, him or herself. Um, I'm privileged to be joined today by a really distinguished panel of folks who have done this in practice and also done this as scholars uh, for, I think, more than 200 years between all of us. Um, and I'll let you do the math to figure out who's older or younger. We're aging, we're aging out. We're aging out. Uh, that's right. So uh, to my left and your right is John Tien. He's a retired Army officer with an incredibly distinguished record, including combat command in Iraq and three years of service, three years or four years on the NSC staff. Uh, to his left is Rosa Brooks, who's a law professor at Georgetown University, an alumnus of uh, OSD policy, and most recently the author of a book, um, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, on civil-military relations. Book. To her left is General Phil Breedlove, who is a former F-16 pilot. I'm told with Air Force officers who fly, you always introduce them by their airframe, most of all. Um, F-16, right? That's great. Um, but, uh, of course, retired uh, after a long distinguished career as the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, and before that was Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, so a practitioner par excellence. Um, and to his left is Corey Shockey, a fellow at the Hoover Institution, um, an alumnus of the Bush administration's NSC staff and policy planning team, as well as the author with Jim Mattis of Warriors and Citizens, a new edited volume on civil military relations. Um, and so let me throw a question out to all of you, and then I'll, I'll pepper you all with individual ones. Um, you know, this challenge is daunting. Let's say you've got 10 minutes with the next administration's transition team sometime in late November. What do you tell them? How do you get off on the right foot? How do you do this right as a matter of design? John? You know, Phil, the first thing I would say is we, the topic of our panel is civil military relations, and right? And, not focusing so much on the civil or the military, obviously that defines the context, but on the relations. And when I think about that, it's so often there's this presumption that the bureaucracy, either the Department of Defense or any of the other departments or the White House or even the transitions teams would have created this great, very um, you know, efficient, error-free machine that's just going to produce the best policy. That's, of course, our hope, but at the end of the day, what I saw when I was serving the last six months of the Bush administration in the first really two and a half years of the Obama administration, but much more precisely that transition that we're talking about today that would be for the next administration was that this really is an engagement of people. Uh, Eric Edelman said during his panel, he, he talked about human beings and how that really creates, uh, he, he talked about it a little bit problematic. He said, you know, that can create some issues. I look at it and say, I looked at this is really an opportunity, right? To really stand back in, in the 10 minutes, right? To say, remember that on both sides, whoever the new administration is, that the military, uh, and uh, not so much on the political side, the career side, but obviously the uniform military, will look at it and say, this is what the American people, this is what the Republic have put into office. This is what they voted in. And so we have to respect where they've come from, what their ideas are, and to see them as not only folks who have earned the right to sit in the office, right, but also who are now the leaders of the country from the civil aspect. And the, and the flip side goes as well, which was, is to take a look, and it's mostly generals and admirals like, uh, like Phil Breedlove here to my left, 
It's really the general's admirals. At the end of the day, it's also the 2.4 million, but the relationships in terms of the policies that we expect to be created are really going to be made between the generals, the admirals, uh, the civil uh, personnel in OSD, and then obviously the White House, and then in concert with the State Department and others. So to look at it and say these are people that are involved in here and to respect where they came from. Rosa, what's your counsel? Well, I think we're, we're starting with a basic paradox as the, the broad context. I would, I would try to explain to the transition team that on the one hand, we're, we're in an era in which the, the role of the military has been expanding significantly and the military is engaged in all kinds of relatively non-traditional activities all over the world, but even in this period in which the role of the military has been expanding, the number of ordinary Americans or indeed Americans in the policy elites who have direct experience of the military, its culture, its processes, et cetera, has been shrinking. Um, so that's not a great place to be in, and that's the broad context that you can't, I, 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 would, I think I would tell the transition team, and, and for this group of people in this room, this is, this is not telling you anything new, this is reminding you of something that many of you already know too well, you cannot underestimate the degrees of mutual ignorance and potential misunderstanding between military officials and civilian officials, number one. Uh, so don't assume uh, that don't assume that there is a shared knowledge base. Don't assume that there is a shared vocabulary, that when people use words like plans or risks or assumptions, don't assume that they even mean the same things. But I think consistent with, with John's comments, do assume that these are all human beings. And I think that we, we, we can all fall into the trap very, very easily uh, of thinking, aha, all those political pointies, they're all like this. They're a bunch of ignorant fools. They don't know X, Y, and Z. Oh, those military people, they're a bunch of rigid automatons. They've got their systems. They can't break out of them. That's the way it is. They're all like that. And that's never true of either group, right? That they're always going to be excited. Don't underestimate the mutual ignorance on both sides. Uh, but at the same time, uh, don't, don't overestimate the degree to which uh, uh, the sides are homogenous and incapable of changing and incapable of mutual understanding. And I, I think we'll talk in a little bit about some ways to potentially break down the mutual ignorance. But I think step one is just, is just making sure people understand that because a lot of the time, and I think you know, we've all seen this, what happens is that people are using the same words, but they're meaning such completely different things. They don't find out that they meant different things until it's too late. And there's a huge gulf already, but so starting with that assumption, I think, is important. Bill? So I, I hate to dumb this down, but if I, if I really <laughs> look at this in the, the following context, if I had 10 minutes to spend with the next president, I'd focus on what it means to be commander in chief and a few things that are very different. We have the possibility of someone who has uh, rather extensive business experience or someone who has directed a uh, cabinet level organization, but neither has been a commander or really a, uh, delved in the things that are different about being a commander. And that's what I would lean to. And I would use a sort of a very quick examination of three words, the first being authority. And that authority of command and understanding what a chain of command is. We have great organizations like the NSC, OSD, and other fourth estate organizations that bring structure, to deciding, et cetera, and helping to inform decisions. But in the end game, if you pull out the law and you look, there is one single black line that goes out of a combatant commander. It goes to the Secretary of Defense. And then there is one single black line that comes out of the Secretary of Defense, and it goes to the President. So as you deal, Mr. or Mrs. President, with people like me, realize that this is a very short and direct thing. And so command and this authority business, is, it's a contact sport. It's about you transmitting to your commanders and your military leaders what you want to have done. And really, there's only one voice that should filter that, and that's the Secretary of Defense between you and me. Second responsibility. There's not a lot of peers where you sit as the commander in chief. There's no one to your left or your right, and there's no one above you. It all rests on you. And that responsibility is very important. You must decide. Making no decision is a decision and can put us in a very bad way when men and women are in the field or in harm's way. 
And how you exercise this responsibility, I think, is also a matter of style. I heard a really smart young man once write a sm short book called Share Success, Own Failure. Madam or Mr. President, you own military failure as the commander in chief. You should share success with those who bring it to our nation. Finally, obligation. And I don't want to wrap myself in the flag here, but let's do it for just a minute. You have an obligation to your nation, to your troops, to the fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters of everyone that you command. You don't organize them. You don't uh, manage them. You lead them and command them, and you have an obligation to them. And I want to hit a, just one or two more words on the obligation. Again, for senior military commanders, this is a contact sport. I recommend you meet early with your senior leaders. I recommend that you find the one or two most vexing and worrying plans that our nations <coughs> have. And you personally, not your staff, you go delve into these plans with your military leaders so you can hear the challenges and the problems that they have in executing these things. And on the, the flip side of this, expect the following from your military commanders, that they will give you their best military advice, whether you are expected to accept it well or not. Their obligation to you is to give you that advice. Your obligation is to listen to it, not necessarily to agree with it, you must decide, but your obligation is to listen to it. Uh, and finally, just one more time, I would say that when you make a decision or you don't make a decision, um, your authority is exercised one way or the other, and your responsibility for the outcome doesn't change. Thanks, Phil. Corey? So my grand theory of civil military relations is that political leaders get the military they deserve and the military gets the political leadership they deserve. M neither of them are usually very happy with it, but it comes out of a point that Phil was just making, which is that this is a contact sport. Military plans, military activity at the high policy level is a negotiation, right? And, and in the last two administrations, it seems to me that the that the system has silted up somewhat um, and that there's not the kind of limber discussion where political leaders give a context of what they're trying to achieve, the military tells them ways they can do that, um, and you grope your way towards something that is a reasonable military plan that the president actually believes requires the kind doesn't require more than the resources, the attention, the risks, the diversion from other things the president wants to accomplish in order to carry it out. That, that I think we are genuinely at risk of a real brittleness in the system. And when the system gets brittle, it produces bad results. When it's limber and fluid, it works best. The only way to make it limber and fluid is trust. Um, and that's why everybody gets both sides of the equation they deserve. The military leadership has to be willing to learn to speak a language that the political leaders understand. Um, they have to be willing to own what Phil has just said, which is it's their responsibility to give good advice. It's not the president's responsibility to take it. Right? Because that is, the military component is just one input into a strategy. And part of this brittleness that I think we're seeing now is somehow the belief that the military line of operations is the strategy. Um, and that, that is a passport to bad outcomes. And the way to get better outcomes is for the military leadership to listen very carefully to what the president wants to accomplish and listen very carefully to the boundaries of, of willingness, of suitability, of resourcing that the political leadership is willing to give. That is above the military's pay grade to determine. We elect leaders to aggregate our social preferences. On the other side of the line, though, um, what I believe we have seen, especially in the last seven years, 
is a political leadership that wants the military to give it the advice it wants to get, right? And, and that is an unfair thing to expect of your military leadership. Um, you know, as, as Phil said, the president's got to own the outcome. Um, and having the military only say what it is that's helpful to, to what you're willing to do uh, creates the kind of civil military friction I think we're seeing right now. Um, that the American military has an enormously wide latitude to shape policy in the making. And the reason they get that latitude is because the political leadership and the institutional structure creates confidence that once a decision is made, that the military will either resign their commission or carry it out to the absolute best of their abilities. That institutional confidence is proving inadequate to the task of, of trust across the civil military divide in the United States. And my advice to the president would be, if you want it to be better, model the kind of relationship you want your cabinet and your junior staffers to have. That is, don't treat the military like comic book heroes, and don't treat them like victims that didn't have a better opportunity. Um, treat them like citizens. And, and trust them with what you're trying to do, because the best advice on civil military relations ever was given by Les Aspen as a new Secretary of Defense. He wrote a memo to President Clinton in 1993 during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell business, and what he said was, the military is an eminently winnable co uh, constituency for any president. They want you to be successful. You just need to figure out how to talk to them and work to common purpose. So let me push you on this and everyone too, because um, I think we all bear the scars of you know, too many deputies committee meetings and too many cases where this hasn't gone right. What practically do you do? I mean, we're not talking about more IPCs and more deputies committee meetings. No. We're not talking about, or maybe we are sequestering folks at Camp David. I mean, what are you practically going to do you know, and what do you see based on your experience of having worked or not worked? What are a couple of vignettes that could work here? Yeah, I, um, so I just finished doing a study with Will Lexler from the Center for American Progress on how, the inter how to make the interagency work well. And we interviewed a whole bunch of folks about it. And the most interesting interview anybody gave us was Henry Kissinger. And what he said <laughs> was <laughs> that of course, everybody wants the Scowcroft model, right, of how the interagency should work. The problem is nobody can get it, right? Everybody has to be really good at their job for the Scowcroft model to work. And most importantly, the president has to give clear guidance. The president has to trust their cabinet members to do their job. They have to have somebody as ruthless as Bob Gates as the deputy national security advisor who will fire people if they are not achieving the president's objective. It's really hard to make the system work well. I go so back. I would just make it simple and clear. Phil? I go back to the contact sport. Some of the most uh, useful time in my time as the uh, SACUR and the European Command Commander were those times where we actually met with the president at lunch or met with him in other meetings or, or um, he came to the Pentagon and talk to us directly or we had a few minutes to stand around, literally seconds to stand around and have coffee. Three or four of the, the sentences that really guided my last uh, year uh, in command, I got after we stood up from a lunch and we're walking outside of the room of one of the lunches in the White House and the president pulled me aside to talk to me and I watched uh, poor Marty Dempsey and everybody running to try to get over there and hear what was said. But the bottom line was I got manna from heaven for almost you know, a minute and a half, and I got sentences which literally guided what I wrote and said for almost a year. This business, can't, it can't be overemphasized, the fact that while we do have these wonderful organizations that help shape policy and move things around, sometimes it's about talking to the principal watching the principal's eyes, the way they deliver it, the emotion, the way the words come out of their mouth, and you gain a lot of understanding of what they really mean by what they're saying. Can I do a quick follow-up sure. there on what Phil just said? So when we were um, going through the transition, uh, this is in December or so, 
and the new team came in and the president, and this was Jim Jones and Susan Rice and Dennis McDonough and Tom Donlin, Rahm Emanuel. And there was discuss this discussion, and obviously there's two hot wars going on. I was in Iraq, as you said, Phil, uh, and obviously in Afghanistan as well, plus the CT fight. And uh, there was this big discussion, uh, and the president was leading it, essentially, that said, uh, what is the first interaction that the president is going to have with the uniformed military, right? How are we going to sort of orchestrate this? Uh, and the president said, the president said, I'm going to go, and, and then, we, you know, there was the staff, right? So the staff said, well, here's all the different options, right? Here's how it's gone in the past. You can not summon, but that's always what it feels like is the, the Joint Chiefs come uh, to the White House, you sit in the Situation Room, and you deliver some of these lines that Phil just described. Uh, and the president said, and this was the president's comment, and he said, I'm going to go to the White House. I'm going to, they have this thing called the tank, right, where you go into the Pentagon. I'm going to go there, and that would be the first interaction, the first way you should. So I, I totally agree that to, to try to erode against some of the perceptions that Rosa brought up, and she obviously set those forward as a polemic, but to erode some of those immediately, to have the president do that, uh, you know, you've used the word before, protocol, right, to step across and say, I'm willing to do that of myself and, and go to the tank and go to where they're at and hear from them. And, and by and large, when you go to the Pentagon, you're not going to see the folks in Kabul or the folks in Baghdad necessarily, uh, but at least you're going to see some junior military officers along the way, and it means a lot. So I think, you know, you can signal very strong and those things matter. I think um, I want to be completely boring, though, and focus on something that seems kind of procedural and nobody ever feels like they have time to do it, which, which is upfront training and education for, for both groups. And this is something that I think across the government, across the executive branch, uh, historically we, we've been terrible at, that we, we throw people into their jobs, we throw political appointees into their jobs with no training, with a sort of happy, confident assumption that because they're smart people who care about the new president's priorities that they'll do just fine. Uh, and they may know nothing about the agency they are suddenly working in, uh, the, the office within that agency, the military if they're working with military personnel, the State Department, the State Department. So across the board, we're, we're terrible at that. And it has real costs. It has costs in you know, wasted time, bad decisions, unnecessary misunderstandings because we, we as a nation, we as the executive branch, we as the foreign policy and national security establishments can't be bothered to, to invest in creating and making people go through sort of rudimentary training on what is this thing we call the government, the State Department, where is it, what do they do, you know, how is it structured, what offices, well, who has authority for what, the military, what is it, how is it structured, who has authority for what. I think that's you know, particularly costly when it comes to civil military relations. I agree. Uh, because I think the, the, the downside of misunderstandings and, and time waste is so great when it comes to civil military issues. Um, that in particular is an area where we can and, do, do, can and should do something about this. And I know CNAS and Michelle and Phil and others here are already involved in a, a project uh, on a sort of military 101, you know, what is the least that a new political appointee needs to understand about things like the chain of command? Well, that may be a completely alien concept, mm -hmm. even to a very smart, well-educated, thoughtful civilian who really wants to do the right thing. They may have no idea what that means or how it works. And the same goes in spades for sort of every other aspect of how the military works, how the Defense Department works. And, and I think that it can be equally true, obviously, for military personnel. Uh, more senior officers are obviously likely to have had more exposure and more training in thinking about the, the strange world of uh, policymakers and civilian political leaders, but at the working level, often there's none. Uh, and so it, it goes both. And it's, this is boring to do, and we're all so busy that not, we all think we're way too important to pause and spend a week on training. And we all, of course, think that we have nothing to learn. But I do think that if I were advising the heads of uh, a transition team, I would say, Make it happen. If you don't invest in that upfront training, you will be shooting yourself in the foot over and over and over again. And by the time you get to those DCs or IPCs where everybody's mad at each other and tempers are frayed and things are falling apart, it's already, you've already missed the most vital opportunity to solve those problems before they actually start. I want to pile on to Rosa's point and, and raise her some. Um, ben Horowitz, in his terrific book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, talks about this point about training. And the two, two things that resonate with what Rosa's saying is that 
Nobody has time for training. It has to be mandatory if anybody's going to do it. And second, um, have the leadership give the training because otherwise people know it's not important to you if the leadership isn't, aren't the people teaching it. So let me ask a somewhat pointed question. You know, CNAS, we're a bipartisan organization. Um, we try to approach national security issues from both sides of the, the spectrum. Um, the odds are, according to Nate Silver, that on November 8th we're going to elect either a Republican or a Democrat. Um, <laughs> no surprise. How does the partisan divide factor into this? Imagine you've got a Republican president or a Democratic president. What are the differences between them as they approach the civil relationship, recognizing that we put a real premium on having an apolitical military and an apolitical national security structure beneath them? So uh, Jim Mattis and I actually collected some data on this for our book on civil military relations. Which you I, all should buy and read, by the way. It's very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, YouGov designed a series of polls that they ran for us. And it's really striking how strong the commonalities across conservatives, independents, and liberals are on, on these issues. And the, the sense of connection to the military, the appreciation for the military, the 5% of self-described very liberals are an outlier on these kinds of things. And I actually think it's a little bit of a challenge for Democrats to reassure the military that of that commonality across the broad spectrum of views. It's easy to do, um, and Democrats, if, if they are elected, should spend a little time hand-holding, learn to read the enlisted ranks, and have the president not go to the tank, have the president go actually talk to some, list, some enlisted Marines someplace. That would be an even better signal that you get it. I would uh, add one point too that is not aimed at either a Democrat or a Republican, but how they got to the election. There's a lot of things said in elections that then become hard when you have to really start doing the job with alliances and and entanglements around the world. And so how do we make that transition from things that may have seemed like the right thing to do and say during an election to actually executing our responsibilities, uh, et cetera, around the world? I think this is a delicate dance that, that there needs to be some early thinking about because the world, no matter who is elected, has a certain set of expectations. And if it's not who they expected, it can cause some issues. You know, Phil, the, um, it's when we're talking a lot about sort of understanding the other cultures. And one thing that I think from the active duty military, whether it's the enlisted Marines that Corey talked about or the, the generals and admirals in the tank, uh, is that ultimately the military really, by and large, haven't changed their jobs, right? So they have, they're continuing. They have their, uh, you know, a body in rest stays at rest, a body in motion stays in motion. So for the active military, to include in the Pentagon, clearly the OSD policy and their surrounding sort of surround systems will change. But ultimately, they are they're here, right? And they've been here, and they've probably been in those jobs for a year, two years, and maybe even three years, especially down at the service level. Whereas, uh, and so they're well prepared, right? So they've been thinking really hard about this. And my guess is, just knowing many of my friends who are, are the J3, J5, J7 types, they're like over prepared by a factor of ten. Whereas if you think about all of the civilians, right, who've, going, who've gone through, and I saw this in the, uh, the Obama campaign staff they came in, they arrived on the other side of uh, November 8th or whatever that day was and went, wow, we're in charge and we're no longer, I mean, for whatever it was, two straight years, they had been focused on putting President Obama and Vice President Biden in office. And they have a finite amount of time to do some of this training, but they, no matter how much training you do from even October through January, it's not going to be enough to be able to prepare them to the same degree of understanding what's sort of on the other side uh, for, the, for the military. I'll close with one more point on that, which is to say, um, I think generally the, the, the folks in the campaign or those who are now re elected by the Republic are pretty open books by and large, and sometimes books have been written by the candidates themselves. Whereas for the military, and this is harder sometimes, I think, for the civilians, and I saw this when they came in, it's not that they don't appreciate what the active military have been through, uh, but it's really hard to have lived that unless you have served uh, 
in service, and in particular in military service. In particular, for the last two administrations, this has been where we've been a nation at war. And almost in every sense, every single person that you're going to run into, whether you're the Trump team or you're the Clinton team, if when you run into somebody in uniform, they have been outside the wire in some respect in some hot war complex. And that is, uh, it's very difficult to understand what that is, but I think that they, the, the civilians have to make that move towards that understanding. So again, that I would also add that to the education process that uh, Rosa mentioned. Rosa, and then we'll invite some questions from you all. I don't have anything to add on the partisan piece because it seems to me uh, that in some ways it has as much to do with the personality of the president as it does with political party. I, I think that Republicans and Democrats alike have an amazing ability to piss off the uniformed military and, and the other way around, right? So, so I don't know that it, at this point in time, partly for the reasons that Corey mentioned, uh, I think in post 9-11 America there's not a stark difference in, in how the parties are perceived and this election campaign has really mixed it up even more and in some ways that I think are going to be good. Um, I, think that, I think that one, I hope, enduring effect of the 2016 presidential election campaign is that it has is, is further shaken up Americans' assumptions about what counts as a Republican position and what is a Democratic position. In certain regards, uh, the two candidates have almost flipped the usual positions. I think that's a good thing, actually, because I think it opens up more, more space for future candidates and for Americans in general to talk about these issues in a way that doesn't instantly fall into kind of partisan, rigid partisan frameworks. The only other thing I wanted to go back to on the, the training and education, I think this is, we're all really saying the same thing here in different ways, uh, would be to say don't ignore the mid-level and the low-level people. I think that there is a tendency, obviously, mm -hmm. for the senior people who populate transition teams uh, to be thinking real hard about the expertise of the top folks and not to really worry about those mid and lower level people and what they know or don't know. There's just an assumption that that stuff will all take care of itself. But obviously, at the end of the day, the Secretary of Defense is only as good as the Deputy and the Under Secretaries and the Assistant Secretaries of Defense, but they're only as good as the DASDs, and the DASDs are only as good as the action officers. You know, so if you have, if you have ignorance or misunderstanding at the lowest working level, uh, it will move up, you know, because, because when you're a more senior person and you say, I want some options on X, uh, the options that you get are going to be a product of the well-functioning or totally dysfunctional relationships at the lower level and so forth. And I think that goes to just the can't afford to ignore the investment on training. Can it solve every problem in a short period of time? No, it can't. What it maybe can do is make everybody aware of their spheres of ignorance which is probably even more important than being aware, than being competent. You know, be more important, important than knowing stuff is knowing all the stuff that you don't know and having a little bit of a sense of who the other people are who do know it and how to interact with them. You know, that will get you sort of 80% of the way. Well, terrific. That's a great note to pause and open it up to all of you. So please raise your hand and I've got a light in my eye, but I'll try to reach you. Uh, Charlie. Thank you. Really great panel. Uh, General Breedlove, what's your assessment of uh, civil military relations among our European allies? And for the panel in general, uh, to what extent should the uh, military advice that General Breedlove talked about take into account or not the perceptions of the political factors, the political realities? So Charlie, thanks uh, for an easy question. Um, <laughs> So uh, what I'll do is, I don't know the absolute answer, I'll share some thought from my last couple of years in NATO as NATO had to change and watching how our allies uh, approach that change. And um, the paradigm of how things were happening in Europe changed so fast and so hard with Crimea and the Donbass and the realization that the reapprochement was over and that we were into a new paradigm of forces back on the table to change internationally recognized borders. Watching the nations deal with that was quite interesting because um, there, were, there was a certain amount of what I would just call denial. When you can't stand the policy implications of what you're seeing, you deny what you see or you question intelligence or in some way you dodge the responsibility for trying to find your way 
to a policy. Uh, some nations who are felt more threatened, very solid team from political through military to what needed to happen. Some uh, nations where their trade and other relationships were threatened, a lot of dysfunction sometimes between their military and their political as, as one would see a responsibility and the other would see the possibility of loss of opportunity and trade, et cetera, et cetera. But what I would say is this, by the time we got around to Wales, there was so much more unity. They had worked through this. There was a more uh, uniform approach to what the problem is, acknowledging what the intelligence was, coming to understanding what the policy decisions were going to have to be. And then in Wales, I think we saw some real unity across 28 nations and some leadership uh, among some of the larger nations. And uh, it was, so I think what we saw was a landscape that changed from, depending on where you sat, close to Russia, far away from Russia, doing trade, a, a, a lot of dysfunction at first, but as we moved towards Wales, everybody sort of coalesced around being in the right place. I hope I answered your question. I answered so, Charlie, oh, go ahead, Courtney. No, go ahead, John. To Charlie's second question, right, uh, which is, to what extent do the uh, senior military officers, I think in particular in the interagency process, let's say it's at the DC and above level, have to have an appreciation of the political context. I think they, if they aren't, then they are uh, probably way undereducated. And what's gonna happen, it's not so much, uh, and I think Phil talked about this before, best military advice up to the president and to the political uh, appointed officers to decide whether or not to take that. But if they don't have, so they don't have to come with political advice, but I think if they don't, and I saw this in a lot of DCs, PCs, and NSCs, that if they don't have that political context and appreciation of what's going on, that the, either the answers or the questions that are coming from the president and the, and the cabinet members and the other members of the DC and PC process will become incredibly frustrating to, to those generals and admirals because they won't, they won't appreciate, and I, you didn't see it too often, but they won't appreciate why they're being asked those questions, why the answers are being given in such a way. And I think it really goes back to many of the themes that came out in some of the earlier panels around, um, look, at the end of the day, we are in a, in a new uh, body politic in the United States of America where a significant portion, if not the majority, of the Polish American public are, are against many of the national security and international relations um, policy prescriptions from either campaign quite necessarily. Corey. So uh, it's a relatively modern notion, as I know you know, Charlie, that, um, that military options should be independent of political influence. It really comes out of the, the writings on military operational art and strategy after the Napoleonic War, right? Jomini and von Moltke subsequently. What they want is for political leaders to choose an objective and then hand everything over to the military and not meddle at all. And, um, and Lori Friedman argues extraordinarily persuasively in his magisterial history of strategy that that process almost always ends up in bad outcomes that good strategy actually has to be so much more fluid than that. It has to be constantly informed by changing political objectives, by opportunities that may crop up on which you need to understand whether to take the opportunity or not take the opportunity. So, so good strategy is woven really tightly between military and political elements of it. That gets a bad reputation when the political leaders try and do the military's job or the military tries to do the political leader's job. And I think the canonical example is Donald Rumsfeld in the 2003 Iraq War, where he's going through manifests of the number of port handlers and he is not, right, which every major in the army can do better than he does. But what he is not doing is the thing only the Secretary of Defense can do, which is, are these military plans likely to achieve the President's political objectives? And if not, how do I make my enormous institution responsive in different ways? So you wanted to add? A, a, me a mechanical manifestation of this that is still troubling, and, and I know it vexes people on both sides of the 
problem is, uh, is of late. If you go back to the first uh, Gulf War, uh, a plan was delivered that was essentially this plus this gets us to here, this plus this gets us to there, we will do this, this, and this to get this accomplished, and we'll get to our objective. And there was a plan a, a la the very older style of military planning where we, we have a, a road map to a position. Um, what we see more and more today is that plans are much less, are expected to be much less ex, ex, uh, explicit. In other words, they are, they are looked to, and I say this not in an, in an ugly way, but just to, to illustrate, they're looked at as more of a menu. Give us some options here that might get us to here, and then we'll look at some more options here. And what is lost in military translation is often this plus this gets us to there. But one of these and one of these might not get us anywhere. And so the ability for the, the political side, the policy side of the house, to translate down the, the need for certain flexibilities and the ability to understand in a military sense that things are not a Chinese menu and some things are dependent on outcomes of previous planned uh, iterations, these two pieces of uh, thinking have to come together in, I think, a little better uh, way. We're, we haven't really worked our way through this uh, um, in the past, and so I think this is something in the future, getting back to that, the understanding what the other side expects. This policy side needs some level of latitude. The military needs to under, transmit that certain things are required to get from here to here and are maybe not optional in the menu piece. I think this is a piece of work that needs a lot more, uh, a, a lot more focus by both sides of our teams. We have time for one or two more questions. Kate? I'm Kate Bateman. I'm a visiting fellow at CNAS. Um, th my question actually follows um, quite closely from this discussion, um, but uh, I'm thinking of the conventional wisdom that the military is very strong culturally and traditionally on, on writing or you know, thinking through plans, on planning, and also on lessons learned. And the civilians you know, do not do either as well, you don't receive professional training and education for it. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment um, in the first place? Um, second, do you think it has really detrimental um, you know, effects for the policy process? You know, for instance, if the military plan is the most well-developed one on the shelf, we're going to you know, have a tendency to pick that. And then third, um, how do you bridge that divide? And, and maybe how does the, can the transition period be used to bridge that divide? Anybody? Um, <laughs> yes, I think it's true. Um, because, because the level of education that goes into training military leaders, and this is the central part of their profession, right? You minimize your risk by coming up with good plans and thinking about what should I do differently next time. Um, civilians are much less good at that. I don't think it results in a, in a, Maslow's, uh, a Maslow's hammer problem, right? You, which is you privilege the tool at hand. I do think, though, that, that um, because nobody else is good at planning in the American government, or certainly not as good as the people in the military and the intelligence community are, um, what that means is that the State Department very often doesn't hold its own. So the imbalance is a function of the weakness of the civilians in the process, and we ought to um, take diplomacy and foreign assistance and the other elements of a strategy as seriously as we take the military line of operations. And that means training and educating people across the entirety of their career, which we should do with our diplomats, and we, we don't. Uh, I'll badly paraphrase an old axiom, which essentially says the value of planning is not the plan that sits on the shelf. It's the planning that got to there. And the discipline of that process, which some see as very, very rigid, um, uh, that discipline actually brings out a lot of problems along the way that you don't want to face in execution. So the discipline of planning is really, I think, the value of what we get when we hold a plan in hand.
I think this is very much a product of uh, budgetary priorities, too, of course, because uh, if for someone in the military, if you spend your career in the military, you will not only be encouraged to take periods away that are non-operational where you're going back to school, you're required to do so. The, the institutional framework for continuing education within the State Department for the Foreign Service uh, is much, much weaker. It's not funded in the same way. There are far fewer opportunities. That's true in spades for all the other agencies. Uh, uh, you know, if we want the civilian in our foreign policy pro process to have the kinds of skill sets uh, that we increasingly expect of military officers, we need to invest in creating a similar kind of structure for them. Um, I think the problem is even broader, and, and Phil and I were talking about this before this panel started, uh, that in your ordinary educated civilian today is less and less likely than, than 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, to have taken coursework in college on war and peace and conflict resolution and, and you know, any of the kinds of preparatory work that might make it easier for you to jump into that universe. Uh, and that, too, is a funding decision. You know, that, that, uh, in the 1960s, uh, Congress appropriated funds to support you know, regional studies programs and so forth. Uh, there's no perceived national security imperative right now to put public funding into university education that is actually linked to our policy priorities uh, as a nation. And I think that's something that it would be wonderful to see that change. I'm gonna take that question and, and take it on a slightly different angle and tie two concepts that uh, Phil and Rosa said before, and Phil talked about the role of the commander in chief, and it is only his or her role to have nobody on the left and right to ultimately, you know, the buck does stop there as the commander in chief. And that's something Rosa said earlier about the uh, inner, the, the seniors in the interagency process being the exemplars for those who are in the uh, on the more mid to lower level staffs, and that is uh, you talk about planning. Right? When, I, when I think about anybody who was involved in this room or read about it in any books about the various uh, strategy reviews that the Obama administration undertook, especially in the first two years, in particular the ones I happen to be involved with, the Afghanistan-Pakistan reviews, I don't think anybody on the military side would, they may have questioned the questions uh, and maybe questioned the answers, but the amount of diligence, the due diligence that uh, came out of those processes was tremendously detailed, probably more so than anybody would want and maybe goes against some of the things that Corey talked about in terms of was it too tactical. But putting that aside for a moment, really going back to your point about planning, um, that due diligence came from one person in the room and one person driving all of that due diligence because he knew at the end of the day that this was the things that we were gonna decide on, in particular in Afghanistan, but the, the onward effects from there was gonna involve the, uh, the blood and treasure of the United States of America, the sons and daughters that uh, Phil spoke to before, and that due diligence was an exemplar that came from the president, and that was President Obama. Well, thank you very much. I'm reminded of one last vignette um, that I heard about indirectly and saw personally from the NSC that goes to your question, Kate. Um, so Secretary Gates and his staff and the chairman and his staff would come in with binders full of PowerPoint slides, these meetings that you described, John. Colorful maps, colorful tables, lots of briefing materials. This is the Defense Department way, right? We overwhelm with data and with PowerPoint. And I'm told, and I saw in one instance, that Secretary of State Clinton looked at these and said, hmm, not a fair fight. And she took to her staff and said, I need binders too. And the State Department's policy planning staff and others generated binders of their own documents. And so there became a binder war of sorts <laughs> in the sit room. The mine shaft gap. And it's not clear that the outcome ever depended on who had the better PowerPoint slides, but to those staff officers toiling on those binders, they believed it did. <laughs> uh, and just a reminder that, that sometimes the process can have an effect on the outcomes. The people in the room matter. The relationships between them matter. And I really thank you all for your service, but also for this discussion today. And it's now my privilege to turn the table over to Sean Brimley, who will take us home. Thanks, Phil.
I'll just be up here for 30 seconds. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to all the panelists and moderators who prepared so well. I just wanted to, to uh, properly thank our wonderful team at CNAS, Jasmine Butler, Neil Erwitz, uh, Melody Cook, and Gerald Clay, who really were the engine room for this event, the videos and everything, and our whole team at CNAS for pitching in. We're only 38 people, uh, and we, we, we put on good events like this one. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.